All right. I want to now con- continue in our, s- our series that we started. Uh, this is the 12th week of this series uh, called Encountering God. And uh, as much as we've been talking about encountering God and how important it is to actually encounter him and not just be aware of him, being aware is just in the head, but encountering him is experiencing him in your heart. We've been talking about encountering God, but um, this is now the, the, the second week where we're kind of just, I don't know, doing a little mini sub-series under this idea of encountering God, where I want to talk to you about responding to God's presence, responding to God's presence. Now, just by way of context over the last 12 weeks, of course, in Exodus 33 and 34, um, and then by, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the, the middle part of Exodus chapter 34, we see that Moses totally encounters the character and nature of God. And when he does, the scripture tells us that he made haste. He quickly fell down to the ground, bowed down, prostrated himself before God and began to worship him. Encounter leads to worship. Then last week, I... I opened up this interesting passage of scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And it tells the story, the Old Testament story, of the presence of God and then three really unique responses to the presence of God in that one chapter alone. And so just to try to bring you up to speed a little bit, if you missed last week, I beg you, please go online, gracechapel.net, and watch the message. Get caught up. 2 Samuel chapter 6, is, it's this unique, mysterious story about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is, is symbolic of the presence of God. It's about four feet by two feet by two feet, and it's made out of acacia wood. It's covered in gold. On the top of it, there are cherubim. There's angels with their wings over like this, and they're facing each other. The Ark of the Covenant represents God's presence. It's called the footstool of God. It's called the Ark of his presence, the Ark of his power. Um, Of course, the, the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark picked up on the mystery of this unique box and, you know, did Hollywood's creative spin on it. But the fact of the matter is, the Ark of the Covenant was the old representation of God's presence. It's the footstool of God. He said, this is where I will speak and commune with you from above the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant finds its way back into the the people of Israel. It had been overcome by the Philistines. The Philistines send it back. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 6 is where this story really starts to unfold. There's three different responses to God's presence in this chapter And those three uh, responses are, and we looked at this one last week, an irreverent familiarity that produced death. And I want to remind you, uh, if you were with us last week, this is the story of this guy by the name of Uzzah. Uzzah was a man who grew up with the ark of God in his house. The scripture tells us it was there for 20 years. So he grew up with it in his house. And when David finally got to the point, King David got to the point where he said, hey, I want to bring it to the city of David, um, they decided on their own to put the Ark of the Covenant on a brand new cart and to send it, send it on its way. As the cart was going with the Ark, it says that the, the oxen stumbled and that Uzzah did something that looked actually kind of responsible Uh, in the moment, but was a deadly mistake. The scripture says that Uzzah irreverently grabbed a hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled, and it sounds like he was trying to keep it from falling off of the ark. Sounds like he's being responsible and well-intentioned. How many of you know good intentions, but that lead to disobedience doesn't bring the blessing of God? Good intentions aren't like a cover for us as we handle God's presence improperly. So Uzzah reaches out, grabs a hold of the Ark of the Covenant. Now listen, he wasn't supposed to touch it, let alone grab it with irreverent familiarity. Why did he do that? 
Because he grew up with it in his house. He was used to it. He was used to the presence of God. He got familiar with it and lost being intimate with God's presence. Massive difference between familiarity and intimacy. Familiarity brings contempt. Intimacy brings communion. So he grabs a hold of it and God strikes him on the spot. That's where we are in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Irreverent familiarity, it produces death. It produced physical death in Uzzah. It produces spiritual death in us. If we ever leave first love intimacy with Jesus and begin to treat him just like, oh, we're used to him, we're used to worship, we're used to being around him. When we start departing from first love passion and honeymoon love, we are in a dangerous place with the presence of God. Now, our second response that we're gonna look at today is passionate worship that produces blessing. We're gonna unpack this in just a wee bit. And then next week, and I want you to, to see all of this. If you wanna read ahead into 2 Samuel 6, I read the whole chapter last week. Refresh yourselves, go and read it again. Next week, I wanna talk to you about mockery that produces barrenness. This is David's wife, Michael, who treated David poorly, to say the least, and it produced barrenness in her. All right, now, I wanna look this morning at David's response to God after the tragic event of Uzzah touching, grabbing hold of the ark with irreverent familiarity. Open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter six. We're gonna read verses eight through 15. The scripture says that David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And David called the name of the place Perez Uzzah, meaning breakout or breakthrough against Uzzah. It's called that, he says, to this day. David was also afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Just in case you're looking for a new baby's name, try that one out. Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. Now look at what happened with the presence of God rightly in someone's house. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now it was told King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. Now just hold on a second. There was an undeniable blessing on the household of Obed-Edom. And it was undeniable that it was there, the blessing was there, because of the presence of God that was there. They, 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 they realized this wasn't a blessing that came by the, the extra effort of Obed-Edom. This was a supernatural increase that came because the presence of God was in this house. We should all long for the presence in our homes. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, and he did it with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of of a trumpet. Beloved, David's initial response towards God was anger and fear. He was angry with God because he, he judged God's judgment as being too excessive on Uzzah. And so he was angry, he was mad at God. He was fearful of God because he feared how to move the Ark of the Covenant and to get it to the city of David, his home, without being struck down like Uzzah was. 
So anger and fear gripped David's heart. And yet, God's presence in the ark, in the house of Obed-Edom, brought an undeniable blessing for three months. David then gets word of it and realizes the issue, the problem, isn't with the presence of God being too harsh or strict or judgmental. The issue is we have mishandled God. The issue is we have been irreverent and familiar with God. And we have got to make a serious adjustment on our parts. So, beloved, this adjustment. I want to give you three things this morning that help us understand maybe, just maybe, where our own adjustments need to happen as it relates to us responding to the presence of God. How did David respond to the presence of God? Here you go, number one, seriously. All right? Seriously. Now, I want to point something else out to you just by way of background. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and 16 are parallel passages. that They tell the same story, just a little bit different angle on it, but you can get the feeling for it. David responded to this tragedy seriously. After he heard of the blessing on Obed-Edom's house, David did something in 1 Chronicles 15 that tells us that he was serious about making an adjustment. In, in verses 12 through 14 specifically, he calls the leaders together and he says to them, hey guys, listen to me. Y'all need to consecrate yourself or sanctify yourselves. You need to um, um, uh, find out, consult Look into the word of God about what we did wrong and how we need to properly respond to God's presence. And then we need to follow that prescribed order because we didn't do it right last time. Last time we got it wrong, it produced death. This time, we've got to make some serious adjustments in order to get it right so that the blessing of God can rest upon the nation and not just a house. We've got to seriously make some adjustments. Beloved, they had to go to the word of God and discover how to properly respond to the presence of God, and that is my job and our job last week and for the next two weeks. We've got to go to the word of God, beloved, because if it was easy for David and his people to get it wrong, it could be easy for us as well. I'm humble enough to admit that. Imitating the world's way, which was how they did it with a new cart. Imitating the world's way with a new cart. Again, it was well-intentioned, but it was totally disobedient. Where did they get the idea to put it on a new cart? It was how it came to them from the pagan Philistines. And they just duplicated what they saw in the world. That's dangerous. Grace Chapel, I don't want to sound arrogant by any stretch, but I want to inform you that you all are on the cutting edge of worship in all the world. Are you, are you ready for this? You're on the cutting edge. You know why? Why? Because we actually leave the lights on during worship. No, 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 hold on. It, it goes other places from there. We actually leave the lights on. And, and, and we, we don't have a laser light show going on that's giving people with epilepsy seizures. And, and we don't have a fog machine over here creating a fog storm on the stage to try to imitate the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. You, you see, friends, I, I say this, I, I'm saying this respectfully, but I'm serious about this. I am so afraid for the modern church today. I know I sound like I'm 85 years old. I'm only 54, but I'm concerned like an old man. I'm concerned about what I see in churches today where the lights are off and the laser show's going and the fog's blowing. 
in an attempt to create some type of emotional, pseudo-spiritual atmosphere that moves people emotionally but has like zero spiritual depth or eternal value to it. So we'll, we'll, we'll jump up and down and, and, and all of a sudden, listen, it just looks like we're at whatever latest rock show is touring town. I don't know, I, I, I read the Bible and it says I'm, I'm not supposed to be sitting in darkness. Like he came and spoke to me in my darkness, at darkness and brought me into the kingdom of his light. He's the light of the world. What are we doing sitting in darkness? I'm, I'm not, I'm, gosh, I'm not being critical, I'm being critical. But I'm concerned. I'm telling you as a father, I'm concerned. What are we doing to try to create and hype and emotionalize, emotionally charge this thing and then call it the presence of God? I think we're doing a good job of building new carts. God said, the sons of Kohath and them alone, Numbers chapter four, are to carry the presence. Because God never intended the presence to be carried by mechanics or machines. The presence has always been meant to be carried by people. Our new cart laser light show sitting in darkness fog machine attempts to create the presence of God I think may borderline on insult to the master. Amen. We better be careful. We better be careful. Imitating the world's way, well-intentioned but disobedient, it produced death. Doing it their own way with irreverent familiarity and grabbing onto something because they were used to it produced death, scary stuff. And so it was time for a serious biblical response to God's presence that was rooted in the word and the ways of God. And it is the same for us today. How do we respond to the presence of God? So David responded seriously, number one. Number two, he responded personally. Now we're gonna see this more. I'm gonna read all these verses next week, but I just wanna give you a little reference point. Remember it says that David was dancing and whirling and twirling before the Lord. And then he was met with disdain, mockery, by his wife, Michael. And how does he respond to her? He responds and says in 2 Samuel 6, 21, it was before the Lord that I did this. Michael, let me tell you something. I wasn't dancing and whirling and twirling for your approval. I wasn't doing it to get the Levites' approval. I wasn't doing it to get the other leader's approval. I wasn't doing it to get the people's approval. I wasn't doing it to get the handmaiden's approval. What I was doing was personal. It was between me and the Lord, period. I'm responding to the presence of God. There is an audience of one and one alone. And what I'm doing, I'm doing before him, period. Friends, our response to God's presence has to be personal and has to be biblical. It has to be for an audience of one. It has to be between you and your God. And we can't be concerned about other people's opinions, approvals, or objections. David responded seriously. David responded personally. Number three, David responded humbly. Because the next verse after he says, hey, Michael, listen, what I did, I did before the Lord. Then he also tells her in verse 22, and I'm going to be humble in my own sight. David responded to the presence of God in humility. Now, how do we get that? How do we know that? If we don't understand the fashion in this story, we miss it. The scripture goes out of its way to tell us that David was dressed in what? A linen ephod. 
What does that mean? Why is it telling us that? What it's telling us is David stripped himself of his royal robes. David, if you will, denounced and renounced his royalty, his title, his sovereignty, his reputation, his do you know who I am, his I am somebody. David stripped himself of all of it, cast it aside, and said, I'm making a statement to everybody here. I'm just one of y'all. I am humble and needy and I'm, I'm needing to worship God and encounter him and respond to him in this moment. What means more to me is how I'm responding to God than what you're thinking of what I'm doing. This is so unbelievably important. David is unhindered by the trappings of personal prestige or of people's opinions. It has no hold on him. David understands that the fear of man is a snare. And so he's not fearing man in his worshipful response to God. He's not concerned about what they're going to think if he strips himself of his royal robes and says, I'm just one of you, a fellow pilgrim that needs God and wants to honor him in this moment. Friends, I'm... I'm as convinced of this as I can be. As we learn how to respond to God's presence, I think God has three words for us. I really do. And here's what they are. Strip it off. Just strip it off. No, 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 no. Okay, like, so I've been listening to what you've been saying, Pastor Steve, and, you know, okay, so responding seriously, okay, yeah, and, you know, responding personally, well, maybe, and then responding humbly and not caring what people think. Like, I, I don't know that I can go all that way because, because don't you know that, like, I kind of am somebody. Strip it off! Don't, don't you know, like, you know, that if, that if I'm the one that's actually going to start worshiping and responding to God, kind of like David did, don't you know that, that, that people will kind of think about me, strip it off. I think, you know, if I start doing that, people will start saying things about me, strip it off. Who cares? First of all, nobody really cares that much anyway. They're not thinking about you as much as you think they are. And beyond that, if they are in a position of thinking about you in order to judge your worship, they're not worth giving the time of day to. Do you know what people might think or say? Strip it off. Don't you know what it'll cost me to respond seriously, personally, and humbly? Strip it off. I'm telling you, I know, I know that different things make different people's hearts flutter. I'm, you know what I just, whoosh, what I love, I love this. I love when people who according to the world standards are somebody and unapologetically love and worship and declare Jesus. Can I tell you how proud of Vice President Pence I am for him to say to the entire world, I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, and I'm a Republican in that order. What a man of God, glory to God. How thankful. Here in the great state of Tennessee, our last Two governors, Governor Haslam, Governor Lee currently, men who unapologetically love and serve and make Jesus famous, who worship passionately with their hands raised, unashamed of the gospel or its savior. Glory to God. Judges and senators and people I've been with, congressmen and women who think nothing of taking a public stand for Jesus. Why? Because they stripped it off. Congress, man, Congress, woman, senator, this, vice president, that. It means nothing in the courts of heaven. What means everything is our unashamed devotion to him who is called Jesus the Christ. This is what matters.
As much as I'm convinced that God is saying strip it off, I'm also convinced, beloved, that some of us are just a humble strip it off away from a significant spiritual breakthrough. Some of us are just a humble strip it off away from a significant spiritual breakthrough. God is waiting for you to do something you've never done before in order to get something you've never got before. We have a decision to make. If we keep doing what we've always done, we're going to keep getting what we've always got. And my guess is God is speaking to you like he's speaking to me to start responding a little looser, a little more biblical, a little more free, and not worrying about other things and people and opinions and so on and so on. But being consumed with what he's doing in our life in the moment and responding out of seriousness, responding personally, this between me and you, Lord, and responding humbly. I'm stripping anything off that'll keep me from encountering you. I'm not gonna allow my reputation to block what you want for me. I'm I'm not going to let what other people think keep me from encountering you in a greater, fresher, newer way. I'm convinced that a serious, personal, humble response to God's presence is exactly what Jesus was talking about when he talked to the woman at the well about worshiping God in spirit and truth. Serious, personal, humble. I believe it is spirit and truth worship. He said to her in John chapter four, verse 23 and 24, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers, which means you can worship falsely, that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking, the Father is looking for someone to worship him in spirit and truth. God is spirit, Jesus said, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Beloved, it's when it's serious and when it's personal and when it's humble, it's spirit because we're seriously responding to God's word and God's way. It's spirit then, it's not flesh then. It's truth because there's no phony, showy pretense. There's no us holding ourselves up like we are someone and God is nothing. No, we're saying, God, we're nothing and you're everything. Serious, personal, and humble. It is spirit and truth worship and it is what God is looking for. I believe it with all my heart. Now this serious, personal, humble, spirit and truth response, what did it produce It produced passionate worship and blessing. This is the second of the three responses I've talked to you about. Irreverent familiarity that produced death and then passionate worship that produces blessing. I want you to know, friends, what I have been praying and am praying and will continue to pray. Because I sense this. I sense it in my own life. I'm praying that God is going to unlock in all of us a holy extravagance that is rooted in the scripture and demonstrated in our worship. A holy extravagance. Now where do I get this idea of a holy extravagance? I get it from David's response. I get it from everything that is going on in this story as we've read. A holy extravagance. May it be unlocked in us as we seriously look into the scripture, as we respond personally, and as we act humbly. What does the scripture say? 
Man, I look at the list of things that accompanied David in this procession, this awesome worship service, and I go, man, I want to be a part of that. The church needs to look more like that. 2 Samuel 6, 12, what does it tell us there? It tells us that they move the ark with gladness. Verse 12, it means festive glee. It means like there was, this was a God party. But this particular God party, because it was rooted in the word and the ways of God, the first time it wasn't. The first time it produced death, even though there were musicians and singers and hooping and hollering going on, it was contrary to the ways of God. This time, it's right. It's consecrated. It's holy. It's biblical. It's serious. It's personal. It's humble. And what that produces is festive glee and gladness. It's like, yes, we got this right this time. And God accompanies that rightness with his joy that then produces more joy in us. Next, verse 13. There's sacrifice. Now, I think we miss out on this, and I... I've got a strong opinion, that might surprise you. There's sacrifice in verse 13. And it's not just sacrifice for sacrifice sake. There's something in the detail that lets us know what's going on. This is really about confession. Here's what it says. As they started their journey with the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders of the sons of Kohath, they took one, two, three, four, five, six steps and stopped. Six steps. Why six? Why the number six? Does anybody know what the number six represents in scripture? It's the number of man. It's the number of imperfection and fallenness. That's why the enemy of our soul, what is his number? Six, six, six. They took six steps. And if we don't understand why David said six, it's this. They were confessing that what they had started with originally was a work of the flesh that wasn't rooted in the word or the wills or the way of God. And they needed to make amends for it. They needed to say, God, we're sorry. And so we're going to offer a sacrifice right here, right now to cover our sins. Let's do a transgression offering and then let's do a peace offering for fellowship. Six steps and sacrifice and confession. And when we read in First Chronicles, it goes into more detail. Then when they finally got to the city of David, what happens there in the city of David? They sacrificed Seven rams and seven bulls. Not six. Now it's seven. What is seven the number of? Completion, maturity, finality. What they're saying is, though we started this thing in the flesh and fallenness originally, we've gone our seven and a half miles, we've got to the city of David, and now we're offering seven bulls and seven rams, and we're saying, God, what we started in the flesh is now being finished in the completion of the Spirit. What if our church services were so filled with gladness and festive glee and sacrifice and confession of where we got it wrong? What would that look like? How might it change? What might it do if we postured ourselves that way every single time we came into church instead of just blowing in after kicking the dog and yelling at our spouse? Don't shout me down. Verse 15. It says, as we saw earlier, that David danced with all of his might, meaning so as to loose his very joints. The people were watching, going, I'm afraid he's going to throw his arms out. He was dancing with that kind of vigor. Verse 15 goes on and also tells us then that the whole place was shouting, shouting, friends. It is a strong expression of worship and faith and victory. If you don't have a shout in you, find one. Find a shout. Find a shout. It is why we try to tell people, Pastor Jonathan does a great job, every baptism, hey, y'all, we're getting ready to shout, not for shouting's sake, but because someone made a decision to say yes to Jesus and to publicly recognize him through the sacrament of baptism. Let's give it a shout, and then we shout. It's because shouting 
unleashes supernatural spiritual potential in our lives. And so dancing and shouting, friends, all these other beautiful Hebrew words for praise and worship, yada, to hold out our hands, and toda, to extend the hands, brach, to kneel in adoration, and halal, to shine and to rave foolishly. Zamar, to play music with the fingers. Shabbat, to address in loud tones, because sometimes being quiet just ain't holy. Shaka to prostrate in homage because sometimes being loud just ain't holy. All of these things. I'm I'm not making this up. I'm coming to you with a shepherd's heart and saying, beloved, listen to me. Is it possible that we have gotten accustomed to irreverent familiarity and we've got to go back to the book and take a serious, personal, humble look and say, oh God, how do you want to be handled? And then let's respond biblically. Verse 18, it tells us that then generosity was poured out because then King David, and I trust he made these plans in advance on behalf of and for the baker and the butcher, David made a declaration. May everybody in the country get a piece of meat and a cake of raisins. And the butcher and the baker said, hallelujah to God. (laughs) Generosity. There's something that gets unlocked in us when we worship God passionately, where we don't just bless God, but we bless others. It looses us to engage with others in a way that when they leave our presence, they feel encouraged, uplifted, and blessed. Beloved, David's response to God's presence, serious, personal, and humble, it's got to be ours too. And what it produced What it produced was this holy extravagance, this gladness, sacrifice, confession, dancing, shouting, hand raising, kneeling, prostrating themselves. It's got to be ours too. Where does God need to lovingly come to us who find ourselves so comfortable, so comfortable in lack of expression Where does God need to come to us and say, hey, loosen up a little bit, please? Allow your your body, allow your body to reflect what God has done in your heart. Don't don't quench the, the presence of God when he comes into your midst. Don't throw a wet blanket on it. Don't try to stifle it or shut it down. And good night, if you're talking to someone about Jesus and you get choked up, don't apologize for crying. I cry through sermons all the time. And can I tell you with love, I don't give a rip what you all think about it. I'm not going to apologize for tears. I'm not apologizing for raising my hands. I'm not apologizing for jumping up and down. I'm not apologizing. I think God's inviting some of us. Loosen up a little bit. Good night. You go crazy at football games. Try church for once. I want to say, I'm not promoting some kind of circus atmosphere here. I realized that this was a holy procession. This was a unique parade that was going on. And this response was was appropriate there. It wasn't to get anybody's attention. It wasn't to show off themselves. It, It fit in the moment. And as we increase in an unlocking of holy extravagance, we have to be governed by the Holy Spirit to say, is this appropriate right now for this atmosphere, for what's going on? But friends, I've got to tell you, the American church, our issue isn't calming people down, it's firing people up. This is our challenge. This is our issue. I've said so many times before, 
I would rather cool a zealot than warm a corpse. I would rather find someone who's just got a little loony in the name of Jesus and worship and say, hey. <laughs> you just slugged the person next to you. I would, I would much rather lovingly try to calm someone in a certain circumstance who is alive and zealous then preach to the same Bible Belt Christians every single Sunday. Would you get some life in you for Jesus' sake? <laughs> Come on. If I don't have chapter and verse, then you can get mad at me. But if I've got chapter and verse, we need to talk. Seriously, personally, and humbly. All right, friends, I'm just going to close with this. Near the end of this glorious day in 2 Samuel chapter 6, the transportation of the ark has happened. The meat and the raisin cakes have been given, and you might think that it's over, but it's not. Because the, near the end of that glorious day, King David still isn't done. He finds it in himself under the unction of the Holy Spirit and the holy extravagance of the moment to write a psalm. I want you to do something on your own. I want you to read all of 1 Chronicles chapter 16. You can read the whole psalm. It is a lengthy psalm. I'm going to read a significant portion of it to you right now. And I want you to to try to see, even if it helps your, your mind, close your eyes. I want you to, to see the moment. I want you to see the extravagance. I want you to, to see the gladness. I want you to see the sacrifice, the confession, the dancing, the shouting, the hands raised. I want you to see the several hundred member choir that was there. I want you to feel the electricity in the atmosphere. And it's in that moment, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7 says this. On that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Here it is. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant. You children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord. Lord, glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar in all of its fullness. Let the field rejoice and all that is in it. Then the trees of the wood shall rejoice before the Lord for he's coming to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever and say, save us, O God of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the nations and give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, Amen. and they praised the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah! Family, let's increasingly, would you all say increasingly? Increasingly. Let's increasingly be a church that responds to God's presence with passionate worship that produces blessing. It blesses God and it blesses one another. I'm not praying that this sinks into you today. I'm praying this sinks into all of us today and for every other time we gather, whether it's Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, that God unlocks a holy extravagance in all of us and we never look back from where we were before April 7th, 2019. Forward ever, backward never. In Jesus' name. Amen, somebody? Amen. All righty. Love God and love people. Go make a difference. Let's pack the place out on Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday and believe with me, pray with me that people are gonna give their hearts to Christ. God bless your family. You are loved and highly favored. Have a great week.